You're worthy of our gaze lifted up, God. You're worthy of all of our attention for the next 30 minutes. Oh, how short is 30 minutes in light of eternity, Father? Well, would you give us grace this morning to fix our eyes on you? To fix our eyes on you, Lord. To worship you in spirit and in truth this morning, God. children's director here and I'm just so glad that each each of you are here today um, this morning when I was praying I just um, I heard the phrase uh, cast your burdens on me and I was directed to the psalm in Psalm 55 22 and it says cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you he will never permit the righteous to be moved 
when I was reading that verse, I heard the Holy Spirit say, I want to bring that verse to reality today. That we would know what that means and, and we would feel a tangible shift in our heart, in our mind, in our souls. That we will truly experience what casting our cares in the Lord means. So I just encourage you that as we are worshiping, you if there's certain things that come to mind when I say the word cares, fears, anxieties, disappointments, rejections, all the above, that um, if, you, if you see certain pictures of things or you say them out loud, but you cast them on the Lord, that you ask Jesus to come in and, and take those away. So I thank you, Jesus, that you are here. Lord, I just uh, pray right now that your just sweet presence would fill this place, that we, each of us would feel your unfailing love that you have for us, that it that we would know that it's your joy and your delight to take our cares away from us. Would we see you differently? Would we see the world around us differently when those things are taken away? So we thank you, Jesus, for this time to worship you and to hear from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, before we start worship again, we already started. Before we continue with the songs. This morning, uh, during our pre-service prayer, as I was just praying and asking the Lord, what do you want to do today? I just pictured in my mind, um, not everybody in their seats this morning during worship, but that in the front, in the back, in the aisles, that there was freedom that people were stepping into. There's always freedom here, that there were people that were stepping into that freedom and dancing and singing and pacing and moving around. And so I just want to invite you that if any time this morning during worship that your heart is stirred and you're just like, I gotta move a little bit. There's total freedom here. So where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, right? There's liberty. So let's step into that, take full advantage of that and just worship him this morning.
covers the earth like the waters cover the sea, Lord.
there's just one And there's just one chief and two men's purpose And one main reason for existence All men's main and high ambition
make this your declaration. Catch me up in your story all my life for your glory. Catch me up in your story all my life for your glory. Catch me up in your story all my life for your glory. Catch me Jesus, that you have the glory. Oh, let this be our reality today, though, God. God, that we wouldn't, we wouldn't become lazy or complacent by saying, well, one day you'll get the glory anyway, God. But that today our reality would be you are worthy of the glory. God, that every single decision that we make, every single word that we speak would be unto your name being glorified, Jesus. God, that just like we just sang, God, that you would let us see your beauty, that you would put your face before us, that in the revelation of your beauty, in the revelation of your glory, God, we would see your worth. That every single thing that we do, God, every song we sing, every job that we take, Every single thing, God, will be unto your name being glorified. And show us your glory, God. And show us your worth today. Let it reshape the way we think, the way we orient our lives, God.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. practicing this song, I was just really stirred by just this bridge. I'll build my life upon your love. It's a firm foundation. I'll put my trust in you alone. I'll not be shaken. The reality of Jesus. Just the revelation of who he is, the revelation of his heart. And what we just sang, just being filled with wonder, being filled with revelation of His holiness, of His worthiness. That's the foundation. God is love. So anytime that we're looking at who God is, anytime that we're beholding any facet of who He is, we're building our life upon that firm foundation. 
And it's in beholding him. It's in declaring his worth and his beauty and seeing that and getting revelation of that, that our lives are founded, firmly established, and we can be a great witness to those around us. So Lord, this morning we just ask for revelation of who you are. Increase revelation of your holiness, of your beauty, God, of your love and of your worth. That it would be the foundation of our lives, God people would see us and they would know that we're your people because we're founded on your love. That as chaos is all around, that they would, they would see there's something about that one. They're not being moved. They're not being st- shaken. They're, they're, they're not being anxious or overcome. They're okay. What's the difference, Lord? And that it would be the foundation of your love because we put ourselves before you. Let's just sing this out together. Rachel didn't know that one of the verses I was about to read was Ephesians 1, 15, and praying for a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. And those of you that are uh, going to be serving communion, if you could come and, and get ready, appreciate that. You guys can have a seat if you want, just for a second. If you're new this morning, Welcome going to come to the Lord's table. We do it together usually on the first Sunday of the month, but you can do it as often as you want to. Daily, multiple times a day, whatever, however you're led. I'm going to read a passage from 1 Corinthians 11, but then I want to, I, re, I felt like the Lord uh, really wanted to, to tie in healing with communion this morning. And so just, just follow me there for a moment. 1 Corinthians 11 and Um, Paul writing to the church in Corinth, uh, actually bringing a a correction for how they were taking communion. They were taking it in an unworthy manner in several different ways. They were fighting over the bread, gorging themselves on it, getting drunk on the wine, and not honoring uh, the the purpose that it was there for. And so uh, actually in verse 27, he says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. See right there, that's drinking it in a worthy manner. Eating it in a worthy manner is fully recognizing what you're doing, fully recognizing the body of the Lord. What his body, what he represented on the cross, that his body broken for us was for our healing and his blood poured out for our salvation. So we, when we come to the Lord's table, we fully recognize that. We fully attribute uh, everything good that came from that to Him, and that is taking the body and the blood in a worthy manner. We don't drink judgment on ourselves. But keep reading. It says, um, This is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being uh, disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone's hungry, you should eat at home. <laughs> if you came here trying to get full on the crackers, that <laughs> we have kolaches in the lobby. 
he should eat at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. So he just finishes with a correction there. But I, this is why I think it's so interesting. I turn over to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Paul's writing to the Ephesian church, and he says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heaven in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Wow. So I'm gonna, I want to pray just before we take communion, really that prayer over all of us, that we would have the, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, but specifically in the knowledge of everything that his body took care of on the cross, everything that his blood took care of on the cross, and everything that we are stepping into today, that the Holy Spirit would actually give us each revelation and wisdom to know, to understand fully that this isn't solely a remembrance. Okay, that this is also just a, a very prophetic act that we're doing. It's, a, it's, it's something that's very, very important. It's very, very holy. So holy that Paul corrected a church about doing it wrong. So this isn't a game. You're coming to the, to the Lord's table and partaking in his body and his blood. Something that he's given. And so I'm going to pray that. Ephesians 1.15, Father, I ask this morning that you would pour out a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, Father, on every single one of us, God, that we would fully understand what it means to take the body of the Lord, to, to eat it in a worthy manner, to drink the cup in a worthy manner. Father, that we would really understand the benefits that we have access to because of the cross, that we would really understand that everything, everything was paid for and provided for on Calvary. There's no more payment that needs to be made. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your tender love toward us. Thank you, Lord, that even in doing this act, we, your word says that we are proclaiming the Lord's death until you come back. And even so, Lord, your resurrection. You died and were raised, and you live Thank you, Lord, that every other God is an idol and there's one true living God, and it's you, Jesus. We celebrate you this morning. Amen. Bef before, we, uh, before we receive the, the communion elements, our prophetic team got a few words of knowledge this morning that I'm going to release, and then our action step is going to be to take communion and step into what's already been paid for and provided for. And that's that's going to be the action step on the word of knowledge. Uh, the first one is neck pain and limited range of movement in the neck. Uh, the second one is, uh, the word is intestines. You can take that and if that's you, I'm sure you know it's you. Number three is uh, ankles and specifically pain in the outer area of the ankle. And number four is damage and negative effects from medicine. And the Lord wants to completely heal you of any damage done from medicine that you have taken. Okay, if that's for you, you receive it in faith, and we're just, our action step is 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 we're going to take communion, because in because when we take it, it says right. It's Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. Many of you are sick because you're just not taking the communion in a worthy manner. I was like, okay, so I want to take it in a worthy manner this morning. Would you stand with me? Father, we bless each one here, God, as we receive it. Bless the ones who are serving, God, and we step uh, humbly and confidently, Lord to take of these elements in a worthy manner. Amen. So if you're on this side of the room, if you want, Kathy and Nasreen will serve you and you can take it back to your seats and we'll take it together. And if you're on this side of the room, uh, Chuck and Nancy will serve you and you can take it back to your seat. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean, cause he took and he took my 
I really like that song. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your body that was broken for us blood that was poured out that you didn't spare one drop the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you I want you to hold up your bread I want you to say this is your body which is for me do this in remembrance of me so father we thank you for Jesus Jesus we thank you that your body was broken for us and we take this this morning in a worthy manner in remembrance of you. Amen. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And we do this morning, Lord. Drink this cup thankful for the new covenant that was poured out thankful for our salvation we drink it in a worthy manner in remembrance of you thank you jesus amen sometimes when we take communion together it's a good time for a lot of things. It's a good time for repentance. You've probably heard that before. It's a, it's a good time just to commune with the Holy Spirit. It's a good time to step into healing. It's a good time for these things. Also, just really, I was struck. Rachel's playing this song. I was 
just overcome just with uh, it, with the fact that, that he who's been forgiven much loves much. And I love him a lot. <laughs> I'm just thankful. I hope you're thankful this morning. Are you thankful? Just thankful for everything that Jesus has done for us. Man, let's just thank him. Let's just thank him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Well, you guys can, uh, we're just going to transition into the next part of the service. You guys can give somebody a hug. Tell them how good they look this morning, especially if you're hugging me. Amen. The zero's on the clock. Say it's time for the pastor to talk and nobody to listen. Except for Rick Anderson back on the couch. Hi, Rick. Hi. Hey, where's my daughter, Grace? Grace Hubbard? Happy birthday, daughter. Oh, she's in the other room. Who else's birthday today? Anyone else have a birthday today? Everyone's birthday's important today. All right. Praise God. Well, I, a couple of things I want to, if you are a newcomer today, our able hostesses and hosts uh, gave you a packet. If you didn't get a newcomer packet, uh, did you, if you didn't get one, just lift your hand and we can make sure you get one. It gives you information about us. Uh, we are with a vision. Yeah, great. On the back there. Yeah. Uh, we're here to, the, I always ask the question over the years, why should a church exist? And, you know, specific churches, and we exist, our vision, our, I believe, ministry assignment is first and foremost to move God's heart, and second is to change the world out of a moved heart in our own life. And so there's information there about about what God's doing here among us and gift out there for you if on your way out. There are also prayer request cards in front of you. They go on the prayer chain if you'd like us to pray with you, or you can Put a prayer request on the connect card that's in your packet as well. So I want to uh, give some the announcements. If you've got your bulletin, I'll just hit some highlights here. Uh, this week, we have. I, I'm going to go for the week, and then we'll go the other. This week, we have home groups, uh, Monday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night. So see Pastor Nate for details. I'll, you can look at the bottom of your uh, bulletin to see the the locations as well. Uh, also, well, that's actually it for this this week specifically. 
Then uh, we're also looking for volunteers for our food pantry with the, that we have uh, food every day. If you can help with bringing the food for that to help folks, uh, see Pastor Nate. Also on March 16th, we have young adult. No, oh, I forgot the biggest one. It's at the top. <laughs> we have a new member class coming up uh, called Rith 101. There it is, Sunday, March 24th. It starts. It's four weeks. Pastor Nate's been working diligently on the, the outline for that. And so uh, everything, uh, the basic things of what we believe as a church is in the class as well as getting to know each other. So um, one more thing. Um, well, Young Adult Night, it's in there March 16th. Then worship team. I have a little sticky note on here. This wasn't in your bulletin. Worship team auditions. If you're interested in being on the worship teams, uh, Sunday, March 31st, right after the service, so that's a number of weeks away, You can so you can practice up. Uh, if you're interested, see Rachel Dorth. Rachel's here on the front row. And I can't wait for my audition. <laughs> Better practice. <laughs> Go Glenn. <Yeah. laughs> ah, praise God. Kick the water over it. <laughs> I have a, a, on my heart a verse as we uh, worship the Lord now with our tithes and offerings. Um, is uh, Isaiah 55, 10 says, uh, it's talking about the Word of God, but I think it's also a spiritual principle. It says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. So I think there's a spiritual principle that when God speaks to us through the word or through prophetic uh, insight, he gives us bread and he gives us seed. Bread is things that we would eat ourselves. It's like a, it's like a secret from the Lord to you or a word for you to help you in your own life. As you're reading the scripture, something just, boo, that's a word. And then there are other things that are like seed, that we, you plant seed, you sow seed, you eat bread. And the same is true, so when you share a word that you get from scripture, that's sowing a seed to somebody. Hey, look what God showed me. The same, I believe, is true with our tithes and our offerings. God gives us the ability, the strength to have finances. And so some of those finances we consume on ourselves. We need to have food and transportation, etc. And some see, some things are not for us to eat. They're not bread, but they're seed for us to sow. And so the little saying is, don't let's let's eat our bread and sow our seed. Don't eat your seed. So if you have seed that's to be sown into the kingdom of God, you want to sow it and not eat it. So, so let's can take, if you have something in your hand to give, or you give, obviously, electronically. Lord, we thank you that you, you are the one who gives us your word, and you provide all our needs, and you, your desire is abundance in our life. So, Lord, cheerfully and gladly, we take the seed you've given us, and we sow it. We sow it into the eternal kingdom, your kingdom that's unshakable. Would you take the seed, would you multiply it, that every tribe, every tongue can hear and the, the witness of the gospel can be evident throughout the earth in full measure before you return. We love you, Jesus. Thank you.
Give it up for Paul. I love that he was he was the one singing before this message is given. Paul really values human life just in general and values people, values the one, even if it's across the world. How many miles away is the Philippines? A lot of miles. 10,000 miles. So he values human life, and that's what this message today is about. My name is Kyle. If I haven't met you, I'm the youth leader here and the prayer room director. And I'm really excited to share about God's heart for the unborn, the unborn baby that we have many in this room right now. And even before I start, I'd like for each of the mamas carrying the unborn babies to stand up. We're going to honor you right now. We have six in our church right now. Our small little church has six pregnant women right now. It's incredible. The odds are ever in our favor with the Lord. Is that, is that from a, I think that's from a movie, yeah, Hunger Games. That was not planned. <laughs> well, during worship, I feel like this is just going to set the tone for us. As we were exalting the name of the Lord, I, in my, in my heart, I saw a picture of just in real big letters, the name of Jesus, just glowing over our region as we were singing. But then like over the U in Jesus, I saw the face of a lion like coming out. And we know that Jesus is described as a lion of the tribe of Judah, that he roars, he fights on our behalf, he's fierce, he's ferocious for us. And that's what this theme of this message is really about. It's, it's the character of Jesus as a lion fighting for the unborn children, the ones who can't protect themselves. And so let me start by saying plainly, the cause of the unborn is a modern day civil war issue in our nation, but one that has escalated to an incalculably larger scale than the civil war from 1861 through 1865. As tragic as that actual war was, those four years truly pale in comparison to the war over the innocent lives that has taken place for the last 46 years in our nation. Put, to put into context, the line in the sand for our country in the 1860s, the Civil War, caused the death of just under 620,000 Americans, which is a lot and very, very tragic. But this modern day line in the sand, this eclipses that number of deaths every year. And at its peak, abortion was taking the amount of people that died in the Civil War every six months. In these last 46 years, the death total from abortion in America is 58 and a half million innocents. And I feel that their voice is screaming, if you do the math, 94 times louder than that of the atrocities of the 1860s. I feel as though the blood of innocent Abel from the Old Testament is crying out for justice all over again. But this time through these little ones but with 58 and a half million times more strength than this, that one innocent man, Abel. But I'm thankful for ones like us in this room today, right now, on this day in history, that will walk out of these doors today equipped, better equipped, to add the strength of your individual voices to these cries for justice and to make it so loud in heaven, so loud in the heavenly realm, your cries for their justice that God can't help but to break in he can't help but to act on behalf of these unborn ones who truly can't protect themselves. I love how my mom defined justice in a message she gave a few years ago. She defined it from Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. True biblical justice can be defined as speaking up for those who can't speak for themselves. That's what justice is. Speaking up for those who can't speak for themselves. This Proverbs 31 mama and wife got it. Speak up for the rights. Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. And we're going to do that this morning. And guys, when we fast and pray for these lives that are being cut short, we are enacting heavenly justice and applying the blood of Jesus that speaks a better word over this issue. So be encouraged throughout this message that we are not left helpless or voiceless on this issue. We have all of heaven backing us as we seek to be God's instruments and mouthpieces for the cause of life and the protection of the unborn 
in our day. We are in good company as we stand for life. We have a triune or a three-part advocate surrounding us at all times as we agree for life. We have a loving heavenly father. We have a forgiving son ready to forgive the mother who's, who's going to do this or will do it, but not with our prayers. And the Holy Spirit we have backing us Every little small action that we take to practically stand up for these little ones, we're in good company. Both in our public social arenas where we speak out and in our private prayer closets and prayer rooms. To give you all a scope of where we're going this morning, the first half of this message will be devoted to giving a biblical history of child sacrifice so that we can simply become aware of the enemy's devices surrounding the issue and the ancient satanic roots of this practice. Now, this is not to be preoccupied with the devil because he's not worth our time, but we will just do this to follow the Bible's command to not be ignorant of his schemes. There's a difference between awareness and preoccupation. We are choosing awareness of the devil and these schemes, but we're choosing preoccupation with what we did in worship this morning, with the name, with the man, Christ Jesus. That's who we, we are to be preoccupied with as believers the face of Jesus. But this doesn't mean we deny reality or stay unaware of this real enemy that is causing 58 and a half million people to die. Can you feel the lion coming out in your heart right now for these ones? Let it happen. I hope to see that this, I hope this biblical context allows you to see the reality and equips you to pray. It will teach us that we're not fighting a new battle, but rather an ancient cosmic battle between life and death good and evil, a battle that we engage in as we bless our region by speaking life in the name of Jesus through our prayers. So I'll close this first half of the message with a brief modern timeline, just hitting the highlights, or really the lowlights, and ending with the highlights from what what has happened in our country since 1970. From there, from the second half of the message, we will shift positively into God's heart for the unborn as revealed in Scripture. Then I'll close with a short if we have time, personal testimony of how Brooke and I have felt God's care and love for our little or unborn baby girl that's due in May. It's been very clear. And then I want to close with a prophetic dream that I had specifically for our church family that will all cement this and put it into context. So I trust by the end of this message that God will have moved us so far to his side of the line of the unborn that we can't even fathom even entertaining the thought or tolerating these innocent deaths any longer. I trust that we will move from inaction to action. I trust that we will become sick in our stomachs enough, even at the mention of what goes on in the dark places in institutions such as Planned Parenthood. I trust the scriptures that reveal God's heart on this issue. Brooke and I's short personal testimony about Lane and the prophetic dream to close this morning will all serve to encourage to establish and to cement the value of the unborn in our hearts. So let's pray. Father, I pray that you brand our hearts this morning so hot that we can't help but to be active, unashamed voices for life. Lord, make us a fasting and praying people for this specific cause in our day. God, would you arrest our hearts with your own heart for these little ones. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's dive into the scripture and look at the biblical context of child sacrifice. The Bible contains the heartbreaking tale of child sacrifice practiced in the name of Molech, a god of the Ammonites. Molech worship was practiced by the Ammonites and Canaanites who revered Molech as a protecting father figure. How twisted is that? Images of Molech were made of bronze and their outstretched arms were heated red hot. Living children were then placed into the idol's hands and died there or were, ro- or were rolled into a fire pit below. Some sources indicate a child might also be passed through the fire as a sort of baptism or purification before he was placed in Molech's arms. Molech worship occurred right outside of the old city of Jerusalem in a valley called Hinnom, Hinnom Valley. And because of this, this valley became associated with the idea of hell. So New Testament, when they translate hell in Aramaic, it's actually, it's, they, it's this word for this valley. Gehenna is the Hebrew for it, or the Aramaic, but Hinnom is how we call it in our tongue. So God actually defined hell as child sacrifice. 
is killing innocent life. It, it's a physical, geographical place. Short testimony about the Valley of Hinnom. When I was in Israel for three months in 2014, I was with an amazing missionary family. We had five children. I was taking, or they had five children. I was taking care of the kids, helping them out. We were in Jerusalem, and I was just like, you know, felt like I was in heaven, right? And I see this valley, just literally just to the left of this is Mount Zion, where Jesus will reign forever. There's the Mount of Olives up there, right here. Is the Valley of Hinnom. I didn't know this, though. I saw this beautiful, lush, verdant green valley, and I said, hey, we should go down there and have a picnic. I told the family, and the mother of the family looks at me because she grew up in Jerusalem. She said, no, we don't. No, we don't step foot. In, even We don't step foot in that valley. She said, when I was little growing up, when we were playing soccer in the streets, if a, if a ball went down there, you didn't see it. We wouldn't go get it. That's how serious the Jewish people took this idea that in 3,000 years ago, their ancestors were deceived enough that they were sacrificing some of their children. So it's a very real issue with a real place where it happened. Leviticus 22 through 5 shares God's heart of loudly prohibiting this practice. God speaking to the Israelites. He says, any Israelite or any foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his children to Molech is to be put to death. The members of the community are to stone him. I will myself set my face against him and will cut him off from his people. For by sacrificing his children to Molech, he has defiled my sanctuary and profaned my holy name. He's profaned the name of life that God comes in. Now pay attention to, the, pay attention to this, family. If the members of the community, that would be all the people around watching this, close their eyes when that man sacrifices one of his children to Molech, if they fail to put him to death, I myself will set my face against him, the one who remains silent, and his family will cut them off from the people, together with all who follow him and prostituting themselves to Molech. Many other Old Testament passages affirm God's zero tolerance policy for child sacrifice. May we not close our eyes to this modern form of this evil practice. Now I'll pause here in case some of you might be thinking in your hearts, is the abortion of unborn children with all its medical terminology and fancy laws that protect it. Is that the same thing as this grotesque, vivid, visceral picture from the Old Testament? Yes, absolutely. First of all, let's get one thing crystal clear. These children that are being aborted in the womb are as fully alive as those infants that were being sacrificed on the outside thousands of years ago. Proven medical science shows that a baby's heart starts beating 18 days after conception, a time when most women don't even know they're pregnant yet, a full two weeks before even the earliest abortions take place. <laughs> Every abortion that's ever taken place has been with a beating heart from that baby. The hot spot for when the majority of abortions happen between six and eight weeks is a time when most babies have full movement in the womb. I saw it with my own eyes, with little Lane. She was jumping like crazy. You saw the video. It's a time when most babies have their perfectly unique individual fingerprints starting to form. These priceless, one-of-a-kind treasures are literally being executed every minute. During the course of this message, around 100 babies will have been sacrificed. But instead of sacrificing to the, God, to the visible bronze statue with blazing hot arms, women are sacrificing these babies, to the God of themselves, to the God of their convenience, to their career, to their selfish ambition. As my friend from Austin Christian Fellowship, Jason Gordon, said earlier this week, he said, we live in a culture that sacrifices its children to the God of me. We live in a culture that sacrifices its children to the God of me. Now, how does he or I standing up here have the audacity to say this? Well, in approximately 93% of all abortions, women have cited social reasons as their motivation, not the mother's health or the tragic cases of rape. I'll leave those up to God. So at least 93% of abortions are direct sacrifices in our culture to the God of me. Just so we're clear, that's the target this morning primarily. I know there are other cases that are tragic. 
but primarily those 93% who choose convenience and self over God-breathed and God-fashioned eternal life. Now, behind this selfishness, with, which each woman is very much individually accountable to God for, it's a sin, I believe there is clearly that same satanic spirit that compelled the inhabitants of the promised land 3,000 years ago to create Molech and perform those child sacrifices to that false god. Staggering. The bottom line is Proverbs six seventeen tells us, our God hates hands that shed innocent blood. Now, two more well-known cases, which I'll abbreviate for time, are in the time of ancient Egypt, when the children of Israel were there, and they had grown so, so much in number that they became a threat to Pharaoh and his kingdom. Pharaoh put out a decree that they should kill every male baby boy that came out of the womb. The Hebrew midwives were given this order, and they feared God, and they said no. They found a way to even deceitfully lie to Pharaoh, and God honored that. From that time leading up until um, when all the child sacrifice was happening, there was a savior, there was a deliverer, deliverer named Moses that God was raising up. God gave his family wisdom and creativity to make a little ark, a little boat that they put in the river and put little baby Moses, and he ended up saving God's people, freeing them from the slavery and oppression and bondage of Egypt and causing them to worship God freely. Another context, right before a great deliverer of God's people, the great deliverer who we worship this morning, there was also child murder and infant sacrifice going on. And this is with King Herod in Judea 1,500 years later, right leading up, or right after the birth of Christ. Every male child, two years and under, was commanded to be put to death in the region in and around Bethlehem. But let's take on the character of the Hebrew midwives who stood in the face of the culture of their day. They refused the orders of the most powerful entity in the land in order to preserve innocent life. Could it be, think about this guys, could it be that the dark spirit that was working in Pharaoh and Herod is the same spirit that is trying to rob the life of a generation of future great deliverers of God's people, future worshipers, future creatives, future disciplers who would disciple nations and generations, future fearless world changers who only fear God and whose destiny is to be salt and light and go to the ends of the earth to bring the good news of Jesus or to raise a beautiful family here in America. Could it be that all this child murder and sacrifice that has taken place in the last 46 years is just setting the stage, just like it did in Egypt, just like it did in Judea, in the hill country, setting the stage for a generation of millions of young people who look and act like Jesus, who take upon the call of Moses to deliver God's people from evil and set them into worship? Could it be that a new Jesus people is arising out of these 58 and a half million who were sacrificed? I believe it. After coming back from the Sind, a Christian event last week in Orlando where I saw 58,000 mostly young people, completely in love with Jesus, abandoned for 12 hours in the heat, just worshiping their face off, willing to give it all to him and his purpose, to sell all and go to the Himalayas and just preach the gospel. I say it's very much possible that this is the case. So given biblical precedence, it's not foolish to say that we might just be on the doorstep of an entire generation of young deliverers arising out of this shadow of death that abortion has cast. Now, as in these two stories I just mentioned, God got the final word. In whatever situation, you came in here not thinking anything about this, remember this, God gets the final word as you trust him. The plan to destroy innocent life ultimately did not win out. God warned Joseph, the father of Jesus, in a dream to protect little baby Jesus. God gave the wisdom to Moses' parents and sister on how to creatively preserve him. Could it be that God will release dreams individually to you? Creative solutions, just like he did back then when the same recipe of disaster was there. Solutions for how we are to combat and to destroy the spirit of Molech in our day. Could it be that God gives you small little measures 
that end up making earth-shaking impacts. Nicole. To preserve the future developers and deliverers of God's people. That's up to you. So take these solutions that I know God is ready to release, even as I speak this morning or later tonight as you dream. Grab the practical wisdom on this subject that God says, ask me and I'll give you wisdom. God is desperately seeking partnership to end this evil. Let's shift now. Quickly take a look at a short snapshot of some of the foundational current event uh, roots of this issue from the early 1970s all the way up to the present time. Now, these few facts will serve to inform us as we pray and speak up. Always know that informed prayers are powerful prayers. Targeted prayers, I believe, hit their targets. Those, were, that, those two were free. As Nate said. Okay, in 1970, 15 states liberalized laws for abortion. In other words, it made it easier to have one. This opened up the gate and prepared the way for the famous landmark Roe versus Wade case in 1973, January 22nd. Roe was a 21-year-old young woman from Dallas, Texas, who unsuccessfully tried to find a way to end her third pregnancy before suing the state. Her case reached the Supreme Court where they voted seven to two in favor of her. This deemed abortion a fundamental right under the United States Constitution, specifically the Privacy Act, which if you ask most legal people, they, they find no foundational roots for, for actually attributing this to any, anything that the original framers of the Constitution meant when they talked about the Privacy Act, the right to privacy. This subjected all laws attempting to restrict abortion under strict scrutiny. So this basically, to sum it up, for people who aren't in policy, this made it easier to have an abortion, and it actually left it up to the individual states to determine the amount of weeks that they put the restriction on. Most states adopted a 24-week threshold, where anything in the first two months or sorry, the first two trimesters of a woman's pregnancy, they would have the right to legally abort. 24 weeks is an age where most babies have vital functions and organs fully developed. They can fully feel pain. They even experience, this is what got me, they even experience REM, REM, or dream sleep at this stage. And in most cases, with medical assistance, at this age, they can live outside the womb and reach full health. How tragic it is, guys, that just when babies are starting to dream, and you'll see why dreams are so important to me, just when God is depositing spiritual insight and visions for their life through dreams, that their dreams are being snatched at the whim of the selfishness of their mothers. Later, 1973, Doe versus Bolton, the same year. So you got Roe and Doe. Doe this case opened the door for late-term abortions to be considered in light of certain factors. Those certain factors were um, any factor that the doctor deemed appropriate for a cause of abortion with, with the mother. So a physical, emotional, psychological, familiar, familial, or a woman's age. If they deemed any of those relevant to the well-being of the mother, and that's up to the doctor's discretion, they would have the grounds to kill the baby. So basically, this made it possible for, for maybe an anxious or depressed or a mom who was scared to have grounds to, to abort. So fast forward to current January 22nd on the, the, the anniversary of Roe versus Wade, January 22nd, 2019, this year, a fruit of that Doe versus Bolton case. New York passed the, the widely publicized Re Reproductive Health Act. In short, this law made it way easier for the women in the state of New York to abort their baby after 24 weeks, all the way up until the time of conception. Just so we know, New York has consistently had some of the loosest laws in regards to abortion regulations, so this was not shocking. But guys, I'm gonna leave y'all with some hope in this section. Let's look at some victories. You'll see soon it's a civil war issue, because while New York might be getting more liberal, the beautiful, God-fearing state of Texas is fighting back, and other states. Always in with hope, though, because we, with anything, we serve a God of all hope. It's just, it's what he breathes. 
So both women, guys, in these cases in 1973, Roe and Doe, their real names are Norma McCorvey, that was Roe, Jane Roe, and Sandra Cano, that was Mary Doe. Both of them, guys, experienced extreme redemption later in their life. They later shifted their positions and became active pro-life supporters. How beautiful is this? Give God a shout for these two women. We just say Norma McCorvey is in the cloud of witnesses, if you believe that, I do. She's praying for this very cause right now. She died last year. But we just thank you for forgiveness, for second chances. <laughs> it's amazing. God is restoring the ones who are originally used of the enemy to now show the absurdity of this practice and through redemption, through the blood of Jesus, to shine a light on this deception for what it is. What better proponents than the ones who originally caused it? So if you ever had any, anything that happened, if you're a woman in this room or you know someone, clean slate, God views you clean, holy, able to be an agent of change. Don't worry about it. Move on through the blood. Norma is, yeah, okay, I said that, okay. Okay, so like I said, we're in good company in Texas compared to a lot of the rest of the country. On June 6, 2017, Governor Abbott of Texas signed Senate Bill 8, which is a bill that bans the barbaric practice of killing the unborn by dismemberment or ripping their limbs off. I'm not gonna get too graphic, but that's what it is. While in the womb. This was a big win for life. Just so you all know, Texas has been a state that has consistently fought back against abortion and has had some of the hardest restrictions on it. So keep it up, Texas. Hold the line. And a big scope victory here. Let's look at the trend of total abortions since 1973. The number of abortions in the United States increased gradually from 1973 until 1990 when it peaked with 1.4 million just in that year alone. But it has steadily declined since then until the last reported year from the CDC, the 2015 year, which showed numbers less than half of that peak in 1990 with 638,000. Abortion restrictions, this is statewide, are on the rise too. So that's a good thing. So what happened in these years since 1990? I want to infuse all with hope as you pray. Simply, I believe God has found focused agreement with his heart during these years since 1990. Not that he didn't before. The percentages and numbers actually might look less and seem less of people who are believers, but I believe the purity of these ones that are praying for this issue of the ending of abortion is outstanding. God will always take a few that fully agree with him over a room of 500 who kind of want to be somewhere else. If you don't believe me, just Google March for Life and see the large number of peoples, people that gather each year to pray and make their voice heard on this issue. Massive renewal, spiritual outpouring happened in Toronto and Brownsville in the early 1990s. Revival broke out. Many of the people who are voices today were birthed out of that movement. Day and night prayer movements started across the world in random places on the same day in three different places in the world. 24-7 prayer started in 1999. With people crying out for justice issues, just as this, day and night, according to Luke 18, 7. It'll be on the screen. Just remember this as you pray. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? Say, I'm a chosen one. Will he not bring justice for you who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I believe that these numbers that show the steady decline in abortion since 1990 testify to the reality of a faithful remnant of pure believers that shape history through their cries for prayers for justice. So we are winning. Our prayers of agreement are pushing back the tide as a whole in our country. But this is obviously still very much a civil war issue, as I stated in the beginning. See New York, see New Mexico, see Vermont. But let us continue to fight and pray from our victorious seat in the heavenly realm. Let us pray and fight from heaven down, being seated on the lap of Jesus in devotion, in heaven, praying the cause of life down to earth. All right, we're going to shift now into God's heart for the unborn. The time we have remaining, I want to give you a, a plain view of God's heart for the unborn from Scripture. We saw at the beginning that God's heart and view of justice is clear. It's Proverbs 31.8. It's speaking up 
for those who can't speak for themselves. But more generally, I want to look at the cornerstone verse for this issue, in my opinion. It's John 10.10, the words of Jesus, the famous verse. Jesus speaking, he says, The thief, which you can attribute to Satan, the spirit behind Molech, any power of darkness, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come, Jesus, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. It does not get any more plain than this, folks. God has revealed his perfect will and his perfect heart through, through his son, through all of his son's actions, through all of his son's words. Perfect theology is Jesus. And these words here in John 10.10 10 are no exception. God's will his perfect will for every baby is that they would live, and not just live, but thrive with an abundant, long, overflowing, joy-filled, and victorious life. Anything else is not God's perfect will for them. It's a lie. Satan's perfect will, or the spirit behind Molech, is that infants' destinies would be stolen. Those dreams that they start having would be stolen. That's his will. Their lives killed, and their bodies literally destroyed by those barbaric practices, such as dismemberment, that are in the process of being outlawed in Texas. And I just want to give you one, I believe, perfect example of how much God cares for and values the lives of the unborn from Scripture. It's a story. We will see here in this story just how much God himself elevated the platform of the unborn and chose to raise the bar for us on how we should view and how we should cherish the lives and the wombs around us. I pointed to you, Paul, but you're not pregnant. I just did this. I'd hit, in this church, you hit someone if you do that enough. <laughs> Luke chapter 1, 11 through 17 first, and then we'll skip to 39. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, the angel, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you. Let's just say that children are a joy and a delight to us. And many will rejoice because of his birth. We are rejoicing because of all the births around us. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. Woo. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children. That's what they need. To not kill them to turn the hearts of their parents to the children and to the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's the prophecy from the angel about John. Verse 39, here's a story that, that God really shows how much he elevates the platform of the unborn. At that time, Mary, mother of Jesus, got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby... John the Baptist, leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit at that moment. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. So let us look at a few implications of this story and what the text tells us. It paints the scene of two pregnant women in one home. Mary, who was carrying the unborn Jesus, greeted the other woman, Elizabeth, probably with the word shalom. That's not in Bible, but you can maybe. Just one word or a greeting to Elizabeth, who was carrying John the Baptist in the womb the one who would prepare the way for Jesus about 30 years later, the one we just read about. Now look at verse 41. The key here is the sound of the greeting from Mary and its effect on the unborn John the Baptist. The effect first wasn't on Elizabeth. It was on the unborn John the Baptist. 
Verses 41 and 44 tell us that a physical response occurred in the unborn baby John, a spiritual response, with an infilling of the Holy Spirit to both Elizabeth and John the Baptist, just at the sound of Mary's voice. So this fulfilled the prophecy given by the angel that we just read, a promise that he would be great in the sight of the Lord and he would be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born. Verses 42 through 44 are a clear prophetic utterance from Elizabeth. As she is saying things she could not have known without divine knowledge flowing through her in that moment. She was seeing her old cousin or relative Mary that she hadn't seen in a while. How would she know that the Savior of the world's in her belly unless the Holy Spirit had given her divine insight? She was recognizing that the Lord himself, the God of Israel, was in Mary's womb. But I want us to look at just what or specifically who brought about that divine word of knowledge to Elizabeth regarding this Savior Jesus who was in Mary's womb. So it can be applied from the text that John's infilling the Holy Spirit and leaping for joy was the evidence that he himself, unborn John the Baptist, was the first one outside of Joseph and Mary to recognize the Savior of the world. Did you catch that? Besides Mary and Joseph themselves, of all the people in the entire known world at the time, God could have chosen anyone. He chose an unborn baby, unborn baby little John. Oh, how God elevated the cause, just what these few verses, the cause, the value, and the worth of the unborn. Now, I want us to see this too, that the Holy Spirit working through the unborn baby Jesus flowed up out, the perfect Son of God flowed up out of the womb into the mouth of Mary, and with a simple greeting, imparted this Holy Spirit of joy, joy, joy to the little John, which then, in reverse order, overflowed out of Elizabeth's womb into her mouth to where she then released this beautiful download of prophetic utterance. So let's get this picture straight. And remember, this whole thing is to talk about the value of unborn babies. I believe that this was a blessing here from unborn baby Jesus straight to unborn baby John He had to fulfill the prophetic promise over his life that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what better person to use by God than the great baptizer in the Holy Spirit, Jesus himself, who in all four Gospels, it was said of him that he would baptize with fire in the Holy Spirit. So he did it when he was in the womb. He wouldn't do it for another 30 years, but he was giving us a sneak preview, a download of what he would do. And he did it when he was helpless. When he was totally at the whim of his mother and father's decisions. And he did it through the voice of the mother. He did it through a voice of a yielded mother. And then John the Baptist was filled through Jesus, through the words of his mother, and then it came back. Another yielded mother, Elizabeth, blessed Mary with probably the prophetic strength she needed to keep going. Baby to baby blessing, womb to womb, through the mother's voice. Oh, how God loves the unborn. This agrees, too, that God, the theme all throughout Scripture, that God loves to use the weak to to work through the things that the world thinks are worthless, to display his mighty power so that he gets all the glory. So next time you feel worthless, you're probably about to be used big time by God because that's where he can really use you. Or you feel weak, his power is made perfect in your weakness, Paul. Nothing is more seemingly unweak than an unborn baby. As we close, I want to quickly share three facts about the story of our little unborn baby girl, Lane. Lane Sequoia, due May 7th. She's hanging out in her mama's womb right now. I felt her move and squirm at grandpa's voice earlier. These three little stories have, sh- have shown us, and it's just a test, a test case, test example to kind of corroborate the scriptures we just read from our own personal experience, and that's okay to do. You lead with scripture, and then you say, hey, what has this scripture been true to me in my life? These stories have shown us just how involved, just how intentional our God is toward our little lane as an unborn little baby, an unborn dream of his, and how much he wanted us as her parents to be a connected part of her journey towards life on earth. It doesn't start on May 7th or whenever she's born. It started before that. There's a scroll written for Lane that we're just trying to catch up with. 
And again, I trust these stories will reinforce the purpose of this message to show us all just how much God values the unborn so that we may gain his heart deeper on this subject. And remember, guys, these stories, they prophesy. They tell us what God has done, and therefore they show us that the God that we just sang to this morning, he can do it again. June of 2018, a woman who Brooke had never met before walked up to her at the Heart of David Worship Conference and told her that God was healing and opening her womb. We had no idea that anything was wrong in the first place. Honestly, when I first heard I was like, you crazy. But I'll take it. But it caused an overflow of tears and joy in Brooke. She admitted that she had little fears in the back of her mind, which is normal, I think, for anyone, that you want your body to work right, but you kind of think, maybe it won't. That seems like a very complex process. It's got to all go right. So I understand that she admitted maybe it, she had those fears that she wouldn't be able to conceive one day. But those fears were allayed that night. Am I right? There's two more. Okay. What's the other one? <laughs> just, for, just for truth's sake. Um, but uh, I was at Presence Conference, and she came up, and she said she saw an open womb. And I was like, okay, that's funny. <laughs> like, I don't know what that means. And then Grace came up um, about a month later and said that she really felt the Lord to come over and to pray healing over my womb. And so, yeah. So, yeah, the message is the same, healing and opening the womb, but from two different sources. One of them from our sister was the healing, the open first and then the healing. But we didn't even know anything was wrong. That's crazy. It's not now. <laughs> God heard the words of those bold, courageous women, one of them being my sister. So fast forward two months to the morning of August 28th, 2018, my birthday. God loves to speak to you on your birthday. Grace, wherever you're at. I had a vivid dream that morning that Brooke came into our bedroom and told me that she was pregnant. We exploded in joy in the dream at the time. When I woke up, I told Brooke the dream. I thought it, for, it was for a time in the future, but it was just given now just to let us know that whenever that time would be, we would explode in joy at the news. Well, it turns out that very same day, Brooke started feeling nauseous at about 3 or 4 o'clock. She couldn't eat her thundercloud sub. Something was up. She remembered my dream. It was pretty fresh. It happened eight hours earlier. Went to the store to get some tests, and sure enough, pregnant. She actually asked the Lord if she was indeed pregnant after the first test because the line was a little vague. Hard to tell in the line reader. And he spoke Luke, one word to her heart. He said, Lord, am I pregnant? She heard Luke in her, in her heart. She picked up the Bible to read the very same chapter that we just read out of that shows God's heart from the unborn with John the Baptist and Jesus, their miraculous births. She knew then that she really was pregnant. You can't make this stuff up. But she didn't tell me till two days later. <laughs> she kindly waited till there was a calm in the storm of our crazy, busy, God-filled lives to tell me. I don't know how she waited those two days. But on that morning of August 30th, I woke up with this question in my heart. I even think I told her that day. I woke up with a question in my heart, wondering how in the world did jo was John the Baptist filled with the Holy Spirit 30 years before anyone else would be? Like the divine order was Jesus had to go to heaven, and then he would baptize with the Holy Spirit. Why in the world? I was like, God, is that, is that error? And he said, I can do whatever I want at any time. One. <laughs> but I didn't have any other insight until I went back months later and saw this in the scripture and God had given me the insight of the baby to baby blessing. And you can weigh that. I don't care if you think I'm wrong. That's okay. I could be. I woke up with that question in my heart. But later that night, Brooke says, You're, we're pregnant. So God was preparing even for this message today, putting questions in my heart. I'd read that so many times. Fast forward a few months December 17th, three days before we found out the gender of, of the baby, I had a dream of being in a dirty hole-in-the-wall restaurant. It was a very vivid dream, but I felt God in it, so I, I know I had to dig it out. We were in this uh, Thai restaurant eating. Brooke and I were having a great time. We get called to the back by the chef, and in the kitchen, 
this is a dream, remember, is a sonogram machine set up. And so the Thai chef, who is now a doctor, well, we just went with it. It was like, all right, we're, let's find out now. We just had great pad thai. Let's find out the gender of the baby three days early. And so, <laughs> Brooke picks up her shirt, you know, got the, the jelly and the sonogram. But instead of the, instead of the picture of the, of the baby in the sonogram, which is kind of cool to see, this showed up. You can show Kira and Tom. That showed up on the LCD screen in the Thai restaurant. And I was like, what in the world does this mean? And the doctor slash chef says, well, based on the facial features of your baby, the 3D images, and how you and Brooke look, if it's a girl, it's going to look like Kira Knightley when she grows up. I'm like, OK, sweet. It's gonna, if it's a boy, it's going to look like Tom Brady. Right? <laughs> well, you're, you're about to be happy, Lance, because the next moment, the screen fades Tom Brady out of the picture. So it's just Kira Knightley. So all the people who don't like Tom Brady, this is where you applaud. <laughs> that made the recording for sure. <laughs> so it's just Kira Knightley, and there's this like anticipatory hush in the room. It's like, does this mean it's a girl? And then we waited a few minutes. The chef slash doctor called us back to another room and said, you see this? Yes, it's a girl. And then reinforced based on the facial features and how we see it could look like this. Super wild. I hadn't thought of any of these people. I guess I'd seen Tom Brady just because he's always in the news. But I hadn't thought of Keira Knightley in years. And I just felt the Lord in the dream. It was so vivid. That's a good barometer. It's like you feel the, the kingdom of heaven, peace, righteousness, joy. You feel, you feel the weight of significance of like heaven's destiny of your life. That's how you, you know it's probably a God dream. But we had 95%, that's a rough estimate, of people in our life, very prophetic people that were saying it was going to be a boy. So this prepared us for the unknown. It prepared us for, for finding out that we were having a little baby girl. So why do I tell you all of this, guys? I tell you this, Rith family, to let you know that God is so involved in your story. He wants to speak to you in many ways, but he wants to speak to you in your dreams. He wants to speak to you in questions in your heart when you wake up. He wants to lead you like he led Joseph, like he led Moses' parents. In all subjects, not just unborn children, in everything, he speaks. Believe him for dreams. Believe him for supernatural revelation, for ladies coming up to you randomly, speaking things that only God would know. So could I get, Nate, could you set up that circle of, let's do six chairs, just to honor the one who's not here today. A worship team, you can come up. We're almost done, guys. Thank, thank you all for Hanging in there. So here's another dream. You're like, dang, this guy has a lot of dreams. But this one's really important, I think, for our church family. God is clearly speaking something over us. If six pregnant women are, are in our church of like 100 people, like he's trying to say something. He's saying way more than I'm saying this morning, okay? So there's a lot more for each individual unborn baby and each person who's connected. And we're all connected as a family of God. Their victory is your victory, okay? Always remember that. Someone else's victory is your victory if they're a believer in Jesus. So I had a dream on the morning of January 25th, the same morning of the March for Life in Austin, Texas. So thousands were praying for the unborn and marching in my city on that day. So it's coincidence, whatever. In this dream, I was in the middle of a circle of mothers from our church who were all pregnant. So I was standing in the middle. It was like in a hospital waiting room. But instead of just being pregnant, they each had their belly nice and full, they each had a baby on their laps as well. So it was one in the womb and one outside of the womb. There was a beautiful, peaceful feel in the dream, which I said earlier is often an indicator that God is indeed trying to teach me something through it, to search out the interpretation and the application. So in the circle, I saw my wife, Brooke. You can go ahead and come up. Give Brooke a hand. We'll give all these ladies a hand because we want to honor them. Just to show how much we love them and honor their unborn baby little treasure in there. And they're not going to be mamas. They are mamas. 
So it says, let's honor the mamas. Some of them already are, so that's easy. I saw Sonny, Sonny Hagen. You can go ahead and stand up. I saw Stacy Reese. Woo! She's one of the ones that already has one on the outside. That's, be, that's better than being on the outside of prison, you know. Like I'm on the outside now. I saw Chelsea. Chelsea, you can stand up. Woo! You are pregnant. And then I saw Rachel Jacobs, uh, Coach Tanner Jacobs' wife. She, she was unable to be here today. They're in Ohio visiting family. But I, I have a seat for her. Oh, yeah. No, we are. I got approval. So Rachel Jacobs is in one, in the spirit. If you say in the spirit of anything, it makes it cool. Okay. There was one more I saw who actually wasn't pregnant at the time on January 25th, or at least that she knew of or I knew of, but God clearly did or was about to make her. I actually told her about the dream later that, that same day as we were meeting and praying with some of our neighbors. I joked with her that she actually could be pregnant at the time. And turns out the day before Valentine's, is that right? She confirmed that she is indeed pregnant. So this is a good time as ever to call up the sixth pregnant mama from our church from the dream, Elizabeth Akers. <laughs> Baby Akers, number three, coming to a world near you in October. So October, October 11th, due date. Same day as Asher's birthday, which is nuts. <laughs> Okay, so remember the dream, guys. Picture them each with a baby on their laps as well. Now, for a few of them, two of them, this could be very much a reality. For three, Rachel as well. And Sonny, yes. Picture this, the baby on their lap. Now, this could have many interpretations, guys. With any divine revelation, you need to seek out the interpretation and then the application. The literal interpretation would be true, like I said, for a few of them here. But the two interpretations I felt the Lord highlight were just two simple symbolic ones. The first and most clear to me is this. The baby who was on the lap on the outside, who is clearly alive and functioning in the dream, represents the reality that we just stamped home the whole time. The reality in God's heart that the baby on the inside is just as alive and functioning in the womb as the baby on the outside. He sees them the same way. The very heated civil war question of our country right now in the world of when does life actually begin, I believe was being shown with more emphasis to this picture. The baby on the lap on the outside is just as valuable and alive as the one on the inside. The second interpretation of this dream, I believe, spoke to the little ones and their destinies in each one of these wombs right now. Their destinies, guys, as disciple makers and multipliers of themselves. You see, Jesus gave us a simple command, go and make disciples, which really just means go and make little yous or little me's. As you follow Jesus, go make them like you, as you follow me and make them, and I make you like me. When you look at the essential goal of discipleship, it's to replicate yourself through others as you follow Christ. So deep down, I know the heart of each of these mothers is that their children would first know and love and cherish Jesus and follow him. And from there, lead others to follow him by making disciples or replications of themselves in their faith walk. Now these are really simple interpretations. You're like, why would God do that? Why would he tell you something you already know is what you wanna do? That's what God does though with the prophetic. A lot of the prophetic is just to give us courage what we already know is the right thing to do. So it's just to give you courage as mothers to, to set up discipleship programs from an early age to keep the command of Jesus as he left the earth to go and make disciples at the forefront of your teaching, the cornerstone of their childhood education, that I don't care what grades you make on your third grade spelling test, but I do care that you loved your neighbor as yourself. 
So God repeatedly reminds us what we already know to be true from his word through dreams, through prophetic, and enforces it so we, we would have the courage to go and do it. Now, before we worship our way out of here, I just want to leave us with three quick action steps to join God's heart and stand for the cause of the unborn. The first one is to sign up and commit to pray weekly for the total ending of abortion. If you sign up for this, I'll set up a simple training with you if you would like to do it in the Lake Travis prayer room as a gatekeeper and get you scheduled. The accountability of scheduling it, Mike Bickle says he's 10 times more likely to pray when he actually schedules it and has a prayer list. 10 times more likely to pray. I know that's true in my life. The accountability is really biblical and it helps us to actually accomplish what we know God is calling us to. And also at 6.30 a.m. on Thursday mornings, we pray for family in Lake Travis. So this is, there's no more central theme to family than the preservation of life in the womb. Remember, we saw earlier that from 1990 on, we are indeed reversing the tide of annual abortions. So keep scaling it back by adding your prayers to the furnace on this subject. Let's stand up against Molech, Pharaoh, and the Herods of our day, just like the Hebrew midwives did. Let's stand up against the God of me that has gripped the women over this last 50 years. And if you're scared of an indefinite prayer slot, like, oh, I have to sign up this, I don't want to quit one day, just think of it as a three-month commitment until the end of the Texas legislative session on May 27th. I'll meet you where you're at. Just sign up, give it a try. If you don't like it, that's okay. That's okay. Give it three months. You can text PRAY to 512-538-4099, and I'll train you and show you how easy it is to come in here. We have many gatekeepers in this room. And if you want to do it from your house or from a different place, I'd love to, to know that and to write it down, to know we have someone praying for the cause of life for an hour each week. The second thing is to sign up and join Capital Blitz. Like, that's a, that's a cool word. It is. Cool phrase. It's an initiative led by our own Nicole Hudgens. You can stand up, Nicole, this moment. We'll give her a hand. She is our woman on the inside of Texas politics. Our little out-of-the-way church that has six pregnant ladies right now has also Nicole daily on the front lines of issues like these, of the ending of abortion and the cause of life. I know your team was so instrumental in championing Senate Bill 8, and it's just amazing. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you do. We pray her and people like her with her group are putting our prayers into action. It takes both. You pray and you do. She is a senior policy analyst for the Texas Family Values Group. She will send out in this Capital Blitz initiative periodic updates during this current legislative session with calls to prayer walk the Capitol or to actually sit in the hearings and, be con and consciously bring the presence of God into the Capitol before the big votes on these types of issues. This is where you get in your car, you actually drive to the Capitol, sit in the hearing, pray, pray in the spirit, worship in your heart, and watch God move. As bills concerning life hit the voting floor in the House and the Senate, you can make your voice heard by actually going to the Capitol ground. You can sign petitions and special votes depending on the bill, just like my wife and Elizabeth did on Wednesday when they took their lunch break to actually go over to the Capitol, get on the property grounds and vote for an issue that was a pro-Israel issue. issue. It's a great practical way to put your prayers and biblical con convictions into action. So text BLITZ to that same number, 512-538-4099. Then the last step, this message wasn't about foster care and adoption, but it could have easily 10 different places spun off into that. What if you want to cooperate with the spirit of adoption and help provide solutions to the current brokenness of the mothers who are giving up their children? Just a thought, what if each mother who was considering abortion had assurance that their baby would go into a loving family? I guarantee you that the numbers would drop significantly. You can be a small part, but remember all small parts are world-shaking solution to someone else's brokenness. Our little church family again has someone who's amazing, associate pastor Nate Castan. He leads Fervent Embrace Ministries, which equips families and individuals to take up the call of their heart to foster or adopt. He makes it really easy. 
He takes all the questions and he knows all the answers. If he doesn't, he finds them out. He would absolutely love to help you become the solution to the brokenness that you haven't caused, but the brokenness that you can heal through allowing the adoptive love of the Father to flow through you. And you're never too old for this. Or too young. You might be too, yeah, you, you can be too young. Talk, that's why you talk to Nate, not me. So by texting fervent to the same number, you're not agreeing to adopt or foster care. Don't worry, you're not signing your life over with a text. But simply to se- just to set up a meeting where he will talk you through what it might look like for you to foster or adopt. Practical steps, qualifications. Now if you don't have a phone or don't want to get it out in church because you feel that that's, you're going to get struck down, that's okay. There's three, uh, there's three sign up, sign up sheets with these same things. You can write it down physically. Awesome. So let me pray and then we're going to worship and just bless these women as we, as we uh, go out. It's amazing what God has done. Lord, I thank you for life. I thank you that you're so involved in each one of our lives, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the scripture that tells us so crystal clear that you care for those, Lord, who can't care for themselves, that you protect those who can't protect themselves. Lord, Lord, I pray that you would release a biblical justice in our hearts to care for the unborn, to be a voice. Lord, would you release wisdom, creative solution through dreams. I even pray the same blessing, Lord, that you poured on me for dreams, Lord. I, I release it right now by faith into anyone who's willing to catch it. Just reach up and catch the dreams from God for your future, for the people around you, Lord. Catch them. Lord, release dreams that show people what you have written about their life so you, they can have courage to walk this life out, Lord. We thank you for life. We thank you that even though the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy, you are better and bigger. <laughs> You're so much better and bigger, and you came that we might have life and life abundant. So release abundant life, Lord, as these precious ones step into your heart for the unborn. I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.
love you so much. Thank you, God, for the word today, for Kyle, Lord, for even just the just the boldness and conviction to deliver with such love and with such truth, God. Father, don't don't let us leave changed. I want to get all messed up and not get better. Like, like I just want to stay. I want to stay that wrecked, Lord. When you you that my heart goes Ugh, like I don't want to like heal from that. I want to. I want to keep that, Lord. So, Father, I just ask just to come in and just and rearrange whatever on the inside of us needs to be rearranged, Lord, so that we can passionately, passionately affect change through prayer and through action. Prayer is action. <laughs> prayer and prayer in action. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, you guys are dismissed. Have a great uh, week. Um, the sign-ups, everything that Kyle mentioned are right out. Just you can't pass. I mean, you can't miss them unless you go out another door. But they're right there on that table. And if you need prayer for anything, we'll have our prayer team up here uh, to, to pray with you. And uh, we hope you have a blessed week. Jesus, we